excellent. So compression is something you all know something about, but probably not a lot, all of you, I don't know. Uh, who knows quite a bit about compression? I should like to know. Not a lot. Everybody in this room uses compression. In fact, you probably even know that you use compression. But unless it's something you've implemented or uh, really just taken time to study, you probably don't know how it works or what's in it or uh, when it's best to use this versus that. So I'm going to just kind of go over everything <coughs> real high level. And I wish I had more graphics because it's, it's the sort of thing you need to be able to visualize. But I do have some, and hopefully uh, uh, some from each kind of uh, category to give you an idea. So what is compression? You all know what it is. We take big data, we make it small, and it's not usable in any way while it's in that state, but it takes less disk space. It also takes less time to transmit over the wire, the internet, modem, whatever you have. And if you want to use it again, you have to expand it to its original form. So a compression has to use an algorithm that can do <coughs> that round trip transformation. Um, there are quite a few compression methods. I mean, there are lots of compression methods. There are very few really original ideas behind it. Most of them are derivatives of, the, of just a few original ideas. Uh, I'll go over what each one of them are. But they all, most of them have uh, belong to one of three or four families of compression algorithms. Uh, but they all have something in common. Um, they may or may not actually achieve compression. When you run your data through an algorithm, what comes out on the other end may be larger or smaller than the original. And so uh, if you ever look at, uh, who uses 7-Zip? WinRAR. PKZip. Granddaddy of them all. So if you ever look at PKZip from 1986, when I first started using it maybe, um, you'll see the same thing that you see in 7-Zip's latest version. And that is, if you, try to if you try to add something to a zip, every once in a while you see that it says 0% stored. And it doesn't mean that it didn't store anything. What it means is stored is the algorithm that it used. It did not achieve compression. It just put your file raw into the file into the archive, into the zip file, because it couldn't make it any smaller. And so the compression ratio is zero. It happened with PKWare back in 86, and it still happens today, with no matter, with no matter what um, program or algorithm you're using, it may not always be achieved. So let's talk about why that is. Um, if you could take any algorithm and run data through it, and it was guaranteed to make it smaller than the input as it passed out the output, it would have to be smaller by at least one bit, our smallest unit of data. And of course, if that were a guarantee, you could run it, the output right back through the input. And you could just do it over and over and over until you're down to one bit. How could you ever decompress one bit into the Gettysburg Address? It's impossible. And of course, if you had one bit left and you ran it through one more time, you would have a zero bit file and there's no data there. So theoretic, as far as the information theory behind this goes, you can never guarantee compression with any algorithm for random data. Uh, of course, we don't just compress random data, but that's still the case with any kind of file as far as the information theory goes. S I mentioned families before. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But some of those families are specialized and some are random for random data. Pre-compressed or Certain types of data that can be run through specialized compressors may not compress well with random data compressors. So for example, if I have an Excel file, we all use Excel, but who knows what's actually in that file? You ever look at one? I don't remember. But if I try to put it through a random data compressor, I'll probably get pretty good compression results because that's what they do and they're good at it. If I take something like a WAV file, a uh, sound file, which was recorded raw, not compressed, and put it through PKZip, it may not do a very good job because that data has too much noise in it and can't be compressed as nearly as well as it could be if it were compressed as an MP3, which is, of course, is why we have MP3s. Waves don't compress well enough to make them small enough to use using general compression algorithms. 
But bottom line there is uh, that some pre-compressed data will not recompress well. That's the same thing with some, some forms of data naturally, like a wave file won't compress well without a specialized algorithm. So we have specialized algorithms for specialized data, and we have random data algorithms for everything else. We talk about uh, random data, and that pretty much means any kind of data, not that the data has garbage in it, but that it's un an unknown content to the compressor. It can take anything you throw at it, and it doesn't care what sort of scheme it's in. Whereas specialized knows the heuristics of the data. An MP3 compressor knows what wave data files look like. They know what sort of diversity to find in the bytes. They know that there's time involved between this byte and this byte plus n. And it knows what it can do with that. So we have specialized data on the left and randomized random data on the right. And who can s who's seeing a pattern here? Anyone? <coughs> Nobody sees what I'm? No one's picking this up? MP3, MPEG, video, WebM, PCX, JPEG, fax. What do they all have in common? Media. Media. Everything on the left side is media. Large amounts of, you have something, Alma? Very good. I'll tell you why they're on the right side. But very good. Uh, they're also media. But everything on the specialized side is media. Uh, they're, they're, that's not a hard rule. I just kind of noticed it as I was making the list and thought everything here is media. Media is large. Images back in the day would take most of your floppy disk yet. Now, they don't take much. But instead we do video. Gigabytes and gigabytes of video. Anybody else? I know I got extra hard drives just for all my videos. MP3s, gigabytes and gigabytes of audio files. WAV files, astronomically larger. They were near impossible to put into video games until someone invented MP3 coding. These are all specialized because we can do what's called lossy compression. Lossy compression means that what you put into the compressor is not the same as what comes out when you decompress it. So there's a, I want to go over these, uh, these two diagrams here kind of at the same time here. I'm going to go back and forth. With lossless, everything you put into the input goes out as a compressed file on the output. And when you put it back through the decompressor, you get back exactly the original. That's a guarantee. What we're talking about with lossy, though, this is why it works well with media. Volunteer. Ben, awesome. What, what shape is this right here on the left? Original data with T-tail. Star. What color is it? Red. Very good. What color is the star? Sorry. The <laughs> what, what shape is the item on the right? <laughs> you can press that to original. What is it? Yeah. And what color is it? Now, are they identical? No. Yes, they are. Now, what shape is on the left? Star. What color is it? Red. What shape is on the right? Red. What color is it? Red. Are they identical? No. no. But what shape is it? Star. A star. You know what it is. You know what color it is. Now, if I had only asked you about that star on the right and not the other three, you'd have said star and you'd have said red. This is what lossy compression tries to do. It tries to take the original input and kind of round it out, take out all of the outlying guys that screw up effective compression and leave only the masses which can be effectively compressed. And the result is formulaically <coughs> suitable for the human senses. And that's the key to lossy compression. We don't care about the stuff that got kicked out because our ears aren't sensitive enough, sensitive enough to hear the garbage that came out of our WAV file when we compress it to an MP3. When we watch a video, we can only see, argue with me if you like, but basically we can only see 30 frames per second. 
So if we play it fast enough, our eyes don't notice all of the anomalies in the video as it degrades between keyframes. It looks good to us. So we can achieve much better compression when we take out some of those annoyances that get in the way of good compression. So we talked about the compression families. Mostly uh, from here on we're talking about uh, random data compressors, general compression, and not the specialized lossy compressors. Dictionary substitution uh, is a, a nice way of taking symbols or series of symbols. And when I say symbols, I'm talking about bytes, folks. The algorithm itself could work on any other sort of symbol, but in real life compression, on real life computers, data is broken up into bytes. That's our smallest addressable unit. We can work at the bit level, but basically we have to cut up a byte and we can't really use just pieces. We have to manipulate a byte to get to those parts. Our smallest unit is a byte. So when I say symbol, you think byte or multiple bytes. If we take a set of symbols, a set of bytes, and say, we know this pattern, we've seen it before, I've got it in my lookup over here. What's the index of the lookup? I'm gonna output that instead of the symbol itself. So if I get a symbol, which is a single byte, and my output is 12 bits instead of eight, I'm going to actually lose com on the compression. I'm going to output larger than the input. But as I go, I add an A and I add a B and I add a C as I encounter these bytes. And then I start encountering multiple bytes. I've seen an A, well, now I've got a B. Let's put a B in my lookup and output a new index which is larger than eight bits. Eventually we end up with very long symbols in our table with very small index, relatively small indexes. And in that way, we can output smaller symbols in our output than we found in our input. Dictionary substitution is probably the absolute most common and most, I don't want to say most effective, but very effective uh, means of compression. A reversible pseudo sort, there's only one that I know of, and I wish I had a graphic for it. It's cool. And that's the Burroughs Wheeler transform, but I do have a slide for it. <coughs> Red length coding is very simple. Uh, the, uh, it's still used by one or two things, but generally not in media, only for black and white stuff. Entropy transforms are used everywhere. And you can mix entropy transforms with pretty much everything because they work all by themselves and they don't care what type of heuristics you, you give them. They can still work. Unless all of your data is the same byte, they will probably achieve compression. If all of your data is not the same byte, or is, is the same byte, they probably will not. But and you just don't compress with it. Entropy is very effective for compressing and it works very well with other families. Lossy transforms we already covered and I've got, sorry, I have entropy transforms and entropy coding. Entropy transforms don't, don't compress anything. Entropy coding does. Entropy transforms can be paired with entropy coding to make them more effective. Uh, I'll talk about those when I get to entropy coding. So combining families, I just talked about that, but I have a list here of some that are common that work well together. Th you'll notice that this says DCT lossy transform. We'll cover DCT. Pretty much every lossy algorithm that I know uses DCT, so it's worth covering. <coughs> Dictionary substitution was the first one I talked about. Lempel and Ziv in 1977 put forth a paper on an algorithm for the compression of mi minimum re redundancy codes, I believe is what it was called. It's been 20 years since I read, so let's hope, hope my memory is okay. Then the next year, 1978, they proposed, proposed another algorithm in a second paper, which is similar, but works a little bit differently. They both work under the premise that I described, where they take a set of symbols as they go through your stream and output an index. They just work differently as to how they determine what those symbols are and how they construct their indexes. Uh, it's streamable because it goes from start to finish and it doesn't have to go back and it doesn't have to go forward. It only has to read one byte at a time or one symbol at a time. It doesn't take a lot of memory because it just has to have a table that has recent symbols. If you have a data file that takes uh, 
say you have, uh, if you look at any file, what you tend to see are long runs of a particular set of symbols. If you looked at a PDF, for example, you're going to see a bunch of codes at the beginning with slashes in them, and, and they're very redundant. And so it will achieve compression because it sees redundancy. Symbols repeated over and over. But then it gets to a new, new area where it has a, a bitmap. And this is very different data. And it's not going to have, it's not going to look in its dictionary and find any repeated symbols. But that's okay because it only uses 32K. It's going to eventually clear out parts of that dictionary and put in new ones as it goes. So it starts com achieving compression again. So it's dynamic. And it doesn't take a lot of memory to do that. It'll change as it goes and continually improve on its output. So it works very well and it worked on very early computers. And if you look at 7Z, uh, WinRAR is very good compression. 7Z is, we've determined, I believe, equal compression. And if you look at how it works, the LZMA algorithm is what it uses, and it's based on LZ77. Nothing's changed in 40 years. They, it is a little different. Instead of working on bytes, LZMA works on bits. And so they achieve some stuff that way, and it's, and it's very good. But it's not a new idea. So there's LZH, which is Mibbles at Harbor, LZW, which is Mibbles at Welsh. And they were all improvements, but they were, most of them were strapped with uh, copyrights. And you couldn't use LZW. It was terrific. It was easier to code. It was a little more effective. You could find implementations of it all over the place. And you, you couldn't use it because of the copyrights. So LZMA is not copyrighted. It's in the public domain last I looked. And the implementation is freely available from 7-Zip and probably a million other places. It's terrific. Uh, and that's, that's a library for .NET. So if you need to do any compression that's not uh, Zlib, preserve Zlib. If you were doing LZ compression of any kind in the past, you probably used Zlib to do it. Or if you used a framework built into <coughs> your uh, development environment's uh, runtime, it was probably running on top of Zlib. So every kind of dictionary substitution is pretty much based on these two guys working in the 70s. Run length coding. This, was, this is really easy to understand. If I have a 1 and a 2 and a 3 in my input, I'll output a 1 and a 2 and a 3. But if I have a 1 and a 1 and a 1, I'll output 1, 3. I'll interpret that on the decompression as the symbol is 1, the count is 3. So I just saved a byte by outputting a 1 and a 3, which is 2 bytes, instead of 3 1s, which is 3 bytes. Now what happens if I have 100 ones in a row? Two bytes. That's good compression. Because I output a one and then a hundred. If you're doing speckly though. Sorry? So if you're doing speckly. Now why are we not using run length coding for everything? Because your image is speckly. Well that's one thing. But it's not really that so much as we don't use 16 color pictures anymore. It, well, it'll work with anything, not just images. But the problem is VGA happened. We started having 256 color images, and then people got digital cameras with 24-bit color. You can't come, you'll never, you'll never get two pixels in a row of the same color. It just doesn't happen with today's media. Facts is black and white. That still uses it. Uh, CCITT group three and group four are the algorithms, <coughs> the standards that define the algorithm in fax compression. And those are also used very frequently in TIFF. TIFF is a, a horrible container, if anyone's actually ever used it. Most people think TIFF means black and white image. It's not. It's a container like an MP4 that has, it can have an LZ compressed 256 color image, or it can have <coughs> uh, any number of other things defined in there. It can even have stuff that the TIFF people never conceived of. You just make it so, and TIFF will handle it. But a black and white TIFF image is usually a CCITT group three, group four image, and it is run length encoded. And they do, they do it a little bit differently. Instead of saying, I have n number of white pixels, and then I have n number of, sorry, instead of saying my next pixel is white and there are 100 of them, my next pixel is black and there are 100 of them, it's only two colors. So instead, they just say I have 
200 of this color, then I switch colors and it's 300 of that. Doesn't save them much, but that's how it does it. And it's still run length coding. There is one other place where run length coding happens. Reversible sorts. The Burroughs Wheeler transform was created by some guys at Bell Labs, which at the time was the research and development for AT&T. They came up with terrific stuff. Absolutely yeah, terrific stuff. They, yeah, <laughs> but they shut it down. They weren't making any money off of free knowledge for the world. So, But the Burroughs Wheeler Transform came out years and years after it was conceived and, and put to use because AT&T didn't want to release it or Bell Labs didn't want to release it or somebody didn't want to release it. But now it's out there, and the only place I know that it's used is in BZIP2. I've written implementations for it, and it's... I got them working, but they were so darn slow, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't ever put them to use. You, in order to make uh, a reverse, the, the Burroughs Wheeler transform compress effectively, you have to have enormous. Not enormous. You, you have to. You have to have large as large an input set as you can handle. And by large, I mean like 20k is large. But the larger you get it, the more effective it is. The, problem is it grows exponentially because what you'll do is you'll take a string and you'll create every linear permutation of it, meaning you'll shift it. If it's 10 characters long, you'll shift it one character, cycle the first one around here, and that's one permutation. Then you shift it again, cycle it around here, that's your second permutation. And you'll create a two-dimensional matrix of all those permutations. Now what happens when you sort all those permutations? When you sort 100 of anything, what do you get? Down the left column, you get A, B, C, D. But if you have enough of them, you end up with A, 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 B, 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 B. You get the idea. You start getting redundancy, which is good for compression. We can reduce redundancy into smaller symbols. Burroughs Wheeler Transform is a reversible sort. There should be no such thing, and there's not. This is a pseudo sort. It doesn't sort perfectly. When it sorts this two dimensional matrix. It doesn't look at the first character where all of the letters are perfectly sorted and have redundancy. It looks at the last letter, which magically, thank you science, also has a lot of redundancy. It has a few interruptions between long runs, and run length coding can still compress it very well. And then you can throw an entropy coder on top of it and get even more compression. The longer this string is, the longer your runs get. And of course, Exponentially means that matrix grows in both dimensions <coughs> as you increase your input size. It, there comes a point where you simply take too long to do it and the compression isn't worth it. Decompression is very fast though. Let's look at some of those entropy transforms. Move to front coding, move to back coding, delta coding, range coding, uh, delta, or I said delta, yeah. Let's describe move to front coding. If I have a set of input, I look at the first, the first byte, and say, I'm going to create an index of these guys. He's going to go in position zero. Then I find the second one, and I move him to position zero, and I move the first one up to position one. Now what happens if I encounter the first symbol again? So let's say our input is 595. Five. My index is going to be five in the zeros place first. Then it's going to be five nine, five in the ones place, and nine in the zero place. And then I get another five. I move five to the beginning at position zero. Now instead of an output of five, nine, five, I have an output of zero, one, zero, of zero, zero, one. So I didn't compress anything, but I transformed this from big numbers into low numbers, from high numbers into low numbers. And what that means is as I go along, I'll have a lot more 1s, 2s, 3s, 29 1s, 2s, 3s, instead of 5, 9, 5, 23, 14, 16, 19. It reduces the number of symbols that you have. And it, it doesn't create long runs, but it does increase redundancy overall. And that incre increases uh, compression when you throw an entropy coder at it. So let's talk about the entropy coders. 
The way an entropy coder works, there are basically three entropy coding uh, schemes that you'll hear about. Arithmetic coding is the newest, it's the most popular, and it's the most copyrighted, IBM namely. Huffman codes, named for Mr. Dr. Baby Huffman, and I've implemented those. They're very cool. They're pretty easy to understand. I have a slide for it. And Shannon Fano trees. Shannon and Fano both came up with the same solution at the same time, so they named it after both. And Huffman came up with his solution around the same time, just a little bit after that. Shannon Fano trees are very effective, and most of the time will come up with the same results as Huffman, but there are circumstances where they will not be as efficient. Uh, PK zip and probably most zip implementations will use uh, Shannon Fano tree as the entropy coding on most of their algorithms. Uh, PK zip, WinZip, uh, 7-zip, they all have many algorithms in them, I think six or seven. So they'll choose the one that they think works best and compress with that. So is that You're thinking Diffie Hellman. Uh, That's a whole different presentation. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to cover those too. Okay. Huffman codes are where, you, well, all, all entropy coders are where you take the frequency of all symbols in your input set. And those with that appear more often get a higher frequency, and those that appear less often get a low frequency, or weight. Shannon Fano trees use weight. Huffman codes use frequency, but they're both based on frequency. Arithmetic coding is the same thing, and it's more similar to Shannon Fano trees. So in Huffman coding, the trick is to take your inputs and construct the Huffman tree. If you have the Huffman tree, you can output a series of bits, and that series of bits can be decoded by the decompressor if it has the same tree. So there are two ways to do this. First, you have to attach the tree with your output file so the decoder can have the same tree. That's called canonical Huffman codes. Or you can use adaptive Huffman, <coughs> wherein it starts with a known starting tree with equal weights, and it shifts around according to the frequencies as it goes. The first, canonical Huffman trees, probably require two passes across the input data, which makes them unsuitable for streaming. Adaptive Huffman probably gives better compression, but it also doesn't require you to store the tree. And it's a one pass, so it's suitable for streaming. So adaptive Huffman is more common in probably everywhere. So let's take a set of inputs. Now, they're kind of small. I hope you can see them. Up here I have a letter Z with a frequency of 1. I have a letter Q, frequency of 2, N, T, S, R, E. And the first thing you do is you sort them by frequency. So I've sorted them 1, 2, 26, 31, 46, 47, 68. Can everyone see that? If you cannot see that, can you follow along? I have a mouse, so I'll try to help with that. You sort these, and then you take the lowest two frequencies, and you make a pair out of them. I've noted the first pair was A. I took the Z with 1 and Q with 2. I created a parent node with the sum of their frequencies, which is 3. See how it's square? This is not representative of a symbol. The round nodes are leaf nodes in this tree, and they have a symbol in them. The square ones are just parent nodes. Next, I take the Z and the Q out of this list, and I add the 3. So now I have a frequency of 3, 26, 31, 46, etc. Now again, I repeat, I take the lowest two frequencies, which are now 3 and N, and I create a new node, which becomes B with a weight of 29. I do this again. I take 29 and 31, and I create node C with a frequency of 60. You would think that I could just keep going like this forever, but nay. Alas, I come across, I have 60 and 46 and 47. The lowest two are not 60 and 46. They are 46 and 47. So I create a new node over here, D, with a weight of 93. It's just kind of floating out in, what's that? This is a binary tree, by law, yes. So you'll note that I've arranged it with everything on the left side of the parent has a lesser weight than that on the right side of the parent. These are the all the way through the tree. So the, the 
What it does is it puts the most used characters toward the top. Yes. So, as I'm constructing this, I just keep picking, plucking the lowest two numbers and parenting them together until I run into the last two. Then I parent those and I have the root of the tree. So, I had D and I created E from 60 and 68 here. And then I know that these two guys need a parent of 221. Now I have a complete tree and everything on the left side is lesser than its peer on the right of its parent. It's a binary tree, so every node has two, one, or zero legs. All of the letters are in leaf nodes, and I've denoted on the left side of every parent and the right side are zeros and ones in red. So for my next slide, let's say I wanted to find a T and output it. To find a T, I have to go from the root, I go right, which outputs a 1. Then I go left, which outputs a 0. And I go right again, which outputs a 1. I hit a leaf, so that's a complete Huffman code. So when the lesser symbols, oh, sorry, when the, the higher frequency symbols are output, they are closer to the top of the tree, which means fewer zigzags through the path are needed to get to their leaf, and fewer bits are output to represent them. So that's how they achieve compression. And they all pretty much work the same. They all end up with a tree that can be navigated in two directions with heavily weighted symbols in the short paths and lightly weighted symbols in the, short, in the long paths. We talked about lossy and we talked about the DCT. The discrete, the discrete cosine transform, there are several formulas for it. Uh, you can find them on Wikipedia, but unless you're really interested, you're not going to want to follow along. It's brutal. There are some diagrams in there that make it easy to understand, but I think my star pretty much says it all. It takes outlying data, cuts it off, and uh, that removes a lot of the annoyances that get in the way of effective compression. I have in here an example, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but the one on the left is not compressed at all. It was stored as a bitmap and the one on the right was stored as a JPEG. A JPEG is a series of DCT chopped data stored in a file. And you can see on the left, if you get up real close, on the anti-aliasing here, there are some light blues and some dark blues. This is a good clean white in the middle. And on the right side, you've got some orange, yellow, red, some brown in there. And over here, if you look on a real screen, I can still see it in here. This white is not really as white. It's a kind of brown. Over here, we don't have any blues. These are grayish. And over here, we don't have any yellows or reds. It's all browns. Can anybody look at the left and the right and say the one on the left looks better? Probably not. I can nitpick at it and see that there are difference, differences, and I can tell you what they are. But look how hard I had to zoom in to see it. When you look at video, this becomes much more obvious, but we're pointing out the traits anyway, just so you kind of understand. In this uh, image, I can see speckling all through this brown area in the vacancy. And over here, that is completely smoothed out. It's taken out all those speckles that we can't see anyway, and we don't care about. And it increased compression significantly. But look what it does over here where we have disturbances in the field near the letters we get double speckling. And so hopefully it all evens out, but that speckling, because it's not the input, it's the output, it hasn't affected our compression a lot. What you end up with are a bunch of boxes very frequently. And the boxes, if you zoom in real hard, will be a gradient of colors from left to right, right to left, top to bottom, or bottom to top. And it's incredible how they can compose a picture from very few of those. But that's what DCT does. So looking at the left and looking at the right, you can see the minute differences, but it simply doesn't affect our perception of whether it looks good or not. So the end here, uh, we've covered all of those. This is mostly just for folks viewing at home. Uh, there are many algorithms available. We mix and match them to achieve compression. Lossy compression for specialized data works more effectively, and random data compression is always lossless. And uh, that says encryption. 
Compression can always be achieved. I have an encryption presentation here too, in case you're curious. It can always be achieved, actually. So. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay.